Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone in the five continents, and welcome to another edition of our international English online meetings. So welcome to our um, world community of educators. Okay, so who is our speaker, speaker today? Well, uh, it's our good friend, Randall Davis from the USA, and Mary Scholl from Costa Rica, and James Powell from Canada. Something about my dear friend Randall Davis has worked in the TESOL arena for the past 35 years as a teacher, materials developer, and a teacher trainer, specializing in educational technology, language assessment, and soft skills development. He has been an invited speaker to many diverse places, including Saudi Arabia, China, Peru, Japan, Mexico, Thailand, and throughout the United States. Uh, look at that beautiful photograph. Uh, let me see, there is somebody here waiting to be allowed, okay. He's also the creator of the website, Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, and he currently teaches at the English Language Institute at the University of Utah. In his free time, Randall enjoys training sorry, trail running in the mountains, gardening and learning each day from his mistakes. I love that. <laughs> and finally, uh, James Papel is the associate director with Ventennial Colleges, Colleges School of English and Liberal Studies. He has a master in TESOL. And also our good friend, uh, Mary Scholl, Executive Director at the Institute for Collaborative Learning in Costa Rica, Facilitator at the Center for Holding Space, and Senior Academic Consultant at National Geographic Learning Latin America. So thank you, dear Randall, James, and Mary for being here, and everyone who is present. We hope we enjoy this wonderful presentation. So dear Randall, the screen is yours, Mary and James Papel, gone. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's certainly a pleasure to visit with you, uh, especially with James and Mary and uh, others that are here in attendance. One of the things that I found that uh, the only reason to come to a live broadcast like this is if you have a part in the discussion. In other words, you could just watch it later through YouTube or Facebook or something like that. So one of the things I want to try to do is accomplish today is as I give the presentation, I'm going to have James and Mary uh, address some of the questions as I go through my presentation as well. But if Mary and James, if you can help me as well, anything that you see that comes up in the chat, and that's why we have the chat, is uh, being able to share your voice. And so Mary, James, and others, if you see something that I'm not addressing, something comes up in the chat, feel free to interject uh, and to interrupt because uh, that's the whole purpose. As I mentioned, you could watch this later on YouTube, but I certainly want to bring in live voices because you probably have questions that you would like to have addressed. So um, let me go ahead and uh, begin uh, the presentation today is when we think of uh, you know, AI and its influence on our lives. Often we think about something that is quite new, but AI has been around for five decades. I mean, a lot of us use AI every day, like Amazon or Netflix or anything like that. It just really permeates into our lives in so many different ways. So as part of the presentation, I thought about, well, how can we give a presentation, how can we share ideas that try to address the concerns and interests of teachers? Now, the one thing I don't want to do, and Mary and James help me make sure that I'm staying on track, is one of the dangers of giving a presentation like this is that there can be cognitive overload. In other words, you present, you know, 254 different technologies in 60 minutes or less, and then everyone leaves the presentation saying that was just there was it was like an information dump. There was no time at all to process the information. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover today uh, some general concepts related to AI, explore educators' concerns about the current state of AI in our lives, 
And the other thing is to share some techniques and tools that can be used in a very judicious way across the curriculum. Uh, as, as I already mentioned, I know that there's going to be uh, comments that come into it. Again, Mary and James, if you see some of those, please uh, just interrupt and, and let me know. But what I'd like to do is to begin with is I'd like to start with a broad question. And to, if Mary, you can speak to this very briefly, and then James, is AI a friend or a foe? Mary, could you briefly speak to that? I think it's more about whether what ha what's happening inside of me than what is AI. So if I treat it as a friend, it will be a friend. If I if I allow it to be a foe, it will be a foe. Okay. So it's really more than AI. And we're probably going to see that reiterated uh, in many different ways through the session. Thank you for that. Uh, James, Jim, any thoughts on that? AI. You know, I, I think... Personally, it's a friend for me. It, it helps me in my day to day do a lot of things. Uh, it's become ubiquitous in the way that uh, I'm almost not aware that I'm using it every day. Uh, so I would definitely say I'm on the, the friend side of this, but I can see both sides. Uh, more specifically, I'd like to talk about a couple of questions. And again, briefly, and as I go through the presentation, we'll probably uh, you know circle back on these issues as well. But in what ways has AI had an impact on your work, student learning, both in positive and negative ways? James, could you speak to that briefly and then Mary? Well, you know, I think the, the positive, of course, is speed and efficiency. It really has helped, uh, you know, in so many ways. My Just even the grammar checking of my emails before I send them, I think, is, it has been very, very useful for me in terms of work. Um, I think in terms of the negative, uh, there is a bit of a climate, I guess, of of distrust between faculty and, and students now uh, as a result of AI being present, uh, where people are sort of doubting whether the work is authentic, that is being right. submitted. So uh, I, I think that has created a bit of an issue, but maybe the positive next step of that is, uh, you know, that we are going to be having a lot more conversations and open dialogues about both forms of AI, both artificial intelligence and academic integrity. All right. And some of the comments that are coming in sometimes as a friend and sometimes isn't. Uh, someone made a comment about your comment just a minute ago, Mary. Uh, another person said, uh, depends on the impact it has on my life. Absolutely. And then Laura says AI is a tool, can be friendly or a foe. It's kind of like sometimes maybe AI hands you a gift in one hand and then sometimes maybe you feel like it stabs you in the back with the other. I mean, it can be a real challenge. Uh, Mary, any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I Like you said, I, we've been using AI for a long, many, many years in many different ways. And I feel like it's my life. You know, when the electricity goes out at home, I kind of enjoy the peace and quiet for a while. And then it's like, mm, but I need the uh, the access to whatever I need access to that comes through AI. Um, as far as my work, I have been using some AI, I've been using ChatGPT with an English course. Uh, we're doing an English for English teachers in Costa Rica. And uh, they need to, to get a, a B2 or C1 level on the Common European Framework of Reference. And so... I have been able to give them feedback that would be humanly impossible for me to give um, and to give them like so certain corrections and feedback and possibilities. And at some point I'll be happy to show it to you today. I'm just, I'm like, I think it's just amazing. Okay. In a negative way for me, it's a rabbit hole. Like I just want to go deeper and do more. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, and the other negative thing is to assume that it might be right. You know, I think we have to always have a, a check on it. Um, and, you know, with I've had also, I teach in a program in the United States, a master's program, and I've had students, some students in the past turn things in that really are just so obviously AI and not them. And so I think that really having clear policies and follow up on policy and then checking in with somebody like, why, why is it that you're not really wanting to use your own head and your, do your own thinking? Right. So. It's interesting, some of the comments that are coming in. And we're going to circle back to this one. Louise says, one thing, it won't replace teachers. 
Uh, we're going to talk about that in what degrees and how, what is its overall impact. I think that's important. I see a lot of comments. It depends on how it's used. Uh, another one, it terrifies me. Uh, that, that can be, you know, a, a real thing. It can be terrifying. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for uh, commenting on that, James. Um, so let's go ahead and what I'd like to do. Oh, here, I love accepting AI as a friend. We need to get to know it more. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Well, let's go ahead and talk. And, you know, one of the things I think about, I don't know if you were ever growing up or if you had kids and they go into the bathroom and they squeeze on that tube of toothpaste and the, the you know, the toothpaste comes out. There is no possible way of getting the toothpaste back in the tube. Now, it's out. And I think with AI, is there's a certain level of irreversibility, uh, permanent change that permeates through our lives. There's, there's just no going back. But I think what we're concerned about is how it can be used and in what ways. And certainly, we could speak longer about this conversation about privacy, about bias, about the quality and information. Over-dependence on technology uh, could be a real problem as well. Whoops. Um, teacher and job displacement. People are concerned about that. And ethical and transparency issues. I think, Mary, you are alluding to that in part about uh, that. So as I was thinking about uh, discussing these topics, what I decided to do earlier this year, I wanted to do a, a study, a, a brief study on the use of ChatGPT and how teachers perceive its use. Uh, within my own institution, there's a lot of concern about how it's used. Some people are, uh, you know, like I said, uh, terrified about how it's used as well. And it was interesting uh, earlier this year at TESOL International in Florida, it was like every other presentation, AI, the room was full. The next room, AI, the room was full. The next one uh, on grammar, two people. And so <laughs> certainly... It's, it's uh, of great interest to teachers around the world. So um, what I decided to do is uh, let me ask you briefly, uh, Mary, when you think about the role, you think the role is of a teacher will play in guiding students as, edu as AI becomes more prevalent. Any brief thought on that? Teacher's role in guiding students. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that we need, it's the same role that we've always had. It's just uh, a little bit more intense because there's a lot more access to information. But I think we're, the, we're guides. I think we need to set clear boundaries around what is okay and not okay. Um, and then help our students rise to those boundaries because I think they're going to test us left, right, and center. Um, and also, I think we need to be cheerleaders for it because I think that our students will go off in directions that we cannot begin to imagine. And so we need to like follow them and cheer them on and say, wow, that's really cool that you found that. And, you know, it, this has been happening, I think, since since the internet, but, you know, the teachers, the, the, the previous role of teachers being sort of the all knowing has always been a false role. Mm -hmm. But in the past, I think it was easier to project that role. But I think this makes it even more obvious that we're not the all knowing people. We are accompanying our students and guiding our students on their journey. So good points cool. there. Um, Jim, any thought on that? You know, I, I agree with Mary. I think, uh, you know, our, our role is sort of becoming more like coaches and cheerleaders uh, on the sidelines. I, I think one of the interesting things that, you know, is coming out of this is uh, to, to Mary's point about not being the, the sage on the stage all the time is that we're now kind of working without a net. We're discovering as we go and learning new things ourselves. And that can be, a bit of a, a feeling of, of danger is that as you sort of lose a little bit of that control, but there's so much power in, in going through, uh, you know, that, that journey together, right. And, and discovering together. And I think that's where things will get really exciting and interesting in the future. Yeah. Great. And one of the things that I decided to do, uh, again, if you scroll up in the chat, I've left two links. Number one, one of the link is to the PowerPoint, but the other link is to survey I'm going to be talking about right now. So uh, earlier this year, I decided, as I mentioned, to find out in providing teachers with scenarios, in these particular scenarios, which one do you feel most comfortable as being the guide, as providing opportunities for students to learn? Uh, teachers from 17 countries responded. 
And uh, basically, they were to rate the situation, the scenario, by level of appropriateness uh, using AI to strongly agree with that particular scenario to I uh, strongly disagree. I'm going to be talking about some of those. Uh, and again, feel free to uh, share uh, regarding that. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to just share a couple of summaries before we look at some of the scenarios and uh, some of the comments that came in uh, in, this, in the uh, survey. I presented some scenarios, as I just mentioned, and then teachers could respond to each one. And uh, one person said, I think my approval of AI used in these scenarios, again, we're going to look at some of those, depends on the specific instructions. What instructions were students given? Another one was, I haven't used ChatGPT much. And as we're speaking, I was speaking specifically in this survey to ChatGPT, but we all know there's tons of different AI uh, services out there. Uh, the situations that you've given me have provided me with a wider view of how it could be used. And another comment was, well, in short, it, I, I think that AI shouldn't be the only source of knowledge replacing reflection, replacing a personal effort, and so forth. And the other thing I think which has been commented already is that I think it can be a powerful tool, but a lot of times it has to be used correctly. And how do we define that within certain boundaries? And in other words, what are the guardrails that we've established and put into place? And I think you, Mary, you mentioned, and I think other people would uh, suggest that they've seen times where students produce something and we're wondering where it came from. The question is, did we provide boundaries and guardrails in the first place? So let's go ahead and look at some of these scenarios. Oh, and first of all, I want to comment, and I think this would be threaded connection throughout whatever we do, is that as I talk with students, whether in student use or whether I develop materials on my own, there should be some type of statement of transparency that by doing so, by identifying what tools you're using, it prom promotes continuous learning. We're always evolving and developing, encourages open dialogue of how the information was collected and disseminated, uh, a commitment to truthfulness and being responsible and how we share that information is key. So, um, so what I want to briefly share with you is some ideas uh, in these scenarios. They were about speaking practice, vocabulary, grammar, reading, uh, writing, and research writing. And again, Mary and uh, uh, Jim, if you see anything you'd like to comment on, let me know. So here is scenario number one. I'm, not, I'm just going to talk about a, a couple of these. Uh, number one, again, I said to the teachers, Mia, a middle school student, is learning Spanish in her language class. And she engages ChatGPT, and you can do this, in conversational practice to improve. She, Maria asked ChatGPT to give her a question in Spanish and then in text format. And then she writes a response, and then ChatGPT corrects her Spanish. And the actual prompt would be something like this. Let's practice uh, basic Spanish chat GPT. Ask me a question, and then I will give my answer, and then you correct it. So what I asked with that particular prompt, I asked teachers, how do you feel about that? And uh, here, again, one indicates that teachers felt very comfortable with that. Uh, over on the other uh, spectrum, the five means that teachers felt less comfortable with that. So what does that actually look like? It would look like something like this. The student, after giving that prompt, asks, de donde, oh, the question is, chat GPT asks, de donde eres? And the student writes in, yo soy profesor. Now you can imagine uh, that doesn't look quite correct, but you've given chat GPT the prompt to correct it. So what does chat GPT do? It says, oh, you need a small adjustment. Uh, yo soy de, and then explains the question, de donde eres, ask where are you from. Then it says, yo soy profesor, means I'm a teacher, which does not answer the question. In other words, the student used correct grammar, but not for the context. So in that particular situation, as I mentioned, teachers felt comfortable with that. Uh, the next situation is, imagine, for example, your student is writing a descriptive paragraph, 
But the challenge with many of our students is that they were working with an empty box. In other words, if I asked them to describe their favorite restaurant using descriptive adjectives about smell, about what they hear, about what they feel, sometimes students have no idea on how to do that. For example, it could be something like uh, the words like um, buzzing and relaxed and vibrant and mellow. And what ChatGPT can do is it can actually create, give you adjectives, descriptive adjectives, and then it gives you sample sentences. Now, the prompt I ask teachers is students does, the student does not copy the sample sentences, but use them as models to write down their ideas. And uh, basically, most teachers felt uh, that that type of such scenario where they create sample sentences and uh, adjectives would be a more appropriate uh, use. Mary, any thought on that? That type, your own personal opinion about using ChatGPT in that way? I think it's yeah. I I think it's fantastic. I think it's I think it's great to have models, and models help us raise ourselves up to a certain place. That um, you know, it gives me a vision of what to aim for. Right. I also need to teach students how to create, like, to use a model. Okay. Right? And how do I create something from a model, not just sort of copy, you know, like there might be some stages, like I might change a few words or I might go through and find keywords and come up with five other words that are similar. And, but I think that whole process of learning how to create my own writing after seeing a model is really important. And now you've, it. yeah. And you've alluded to the fact that it depends on the instructions. And sometimes people said, when I provided instructions and I didn't go into more depth, they sometimes asked, well, what are the other parameters? And these are the only parameters that were given in this particular case. But I think modeling and how you uh, leave information, I think, is important. Oh, uh, James says, I, I, I need to ask ChatGPT to help me with my Spanish speaking. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> um, I think, uh, Randall, yeah, go one ahead. That is that... Um, I think chat the working with AI chat GPT is also the, I think the best way to create circumstances where students aren't actually using it to create what they're turning into us is to either include it in the writing process and have them reference it and really get them to practice, but also then to create the final product of the writing process needs to reference our personal experience and reflect on personal experience and integrate theory with our personal experience or language with our person so that it's something that chat GPT can't actually do. Absolutely. And one of the things that I also do is provide students with the prompt. So they know, I mean, there's a real skill to be able to create prompts to elicit the information that you want. Uh, but modeling, as you mentioned, Mary, about bringing in your own experience is something that chat GPT cannot do. Uh, the next scenario was uh, this. It says, James, here we go, James. James is writing a comparison contrast essay on face-to-face -face learning versus remote learning. He asked ChatGPT to come up with five ideas to compare and contrast. They're writing a, th James, you're writing a three-body paragraph, an introduction, three-body paragraphs, and a conclusion. He then brings these ideas to class that were generated by ChatGPT. He discusses the strengths of each in a small group, gets feedback from the group, and then selects the three strongest points. They're not the three strongest paragraphs. It's just that ChatGPT created and at least suggested the strongest points. Uh, points, And then the student discusses those in the class. And then, based on that feedback in class, he writes his own essay. James, any thought on that? I mean, I think this is actually really great. He's, um, you know, we, we want students to gain a lot from reading uh, to be able to use that input in their writing. And, and I think that's what he's done. Um, you know, it could be a different source than ChatGPT, a, a journal or an article, but this is what we want to see out of students. And the fact that he's taken those ideas and then built on them with other students, I think is something that's really a great initiative on, on that student's part. I'd love to see them reference that they've, you know, where they've got this information from. Right. But but I think this is a great way of building on, you know, your knowledge, right? Often when we're writing, we don't have maybe the full 
cultural understanding of, of what we're going to be writing on. And so selecting different viewpoints is one way to get that information. So yeah, I'm, I'm very supportive of this. And the one thing you mentioned too, is you'd like to know where he got the information from for the, for the paper he's writing. And the nice thing about ChatGPT is there is a feature where you can actually copy a link to that generated information. And the student could send that link or include that link in their final paper. So it references at least the source of some of their ideas. Um, Laura says, speaking to Mary's point, since the advent of the internet, we've always had the risk of plagiarism with our students. So the tips she discussed, modeling, I think is a really key point there. Uh, James, just so you know, uh, most teachers felt very comfortable with that. Again, one indicates a high a comfort level. Now, let's kind of go into some other areas. Uh, Maria asked ChatGPT to generate 10 alternative thesis statements for her argumentative essay so she could explore different angles and perspectives. Mary selects the best one generated by ChatGPT and uh, then adds the thesis statement to her paper, perhaps with slight modifications. Well, uh, more teachers felt a little uncomfortable with that. Uh, you know, okay, that ChatGPT creates the thesis statement. What does it mean by slight modifications? Uh, I think, you know, we certainly could explore that a little bit uh, as well. But uh, let me go on to another example. Samantha, a high school student, is struggling with understanding Shakespearean language in Macbeth. She copies one, uh, like something from Macbeth, she pasted it into ChatGPT and then asked it to generate a simplified translation of difficult passages to aid her in comprehension before performing the scene in the class. Many teachers felt comfortable with that. Uh, here is another one. Olivia, a high school student, is preparing for a class debate on climate change. Prior to the debate, she asked ChatGPT to generate a list of potential counter arguments, uh, not that ChatGPT created her arguments, but that she would engage in a debate with ChatGPT so she can create effective rebuttals. She looks over the results to enhance her preparedness for her opponent's challenging, that challenging discussion and arguments. Mary, what do you think about that? You use ChatGPT not to create your own argument, but uh, to think up possible counter arguments and you use that and engage in ChatGPT of a, you know, let's say a, a, a debate. Any thought about that? Um, I think, you know, I could go to the encyclopedia and look things up and I can go to ChatGPT and look things up. Again, I have to double check the sources and double check that they're right. But um, it's like having... It's like having an encyclopedia on steroids, you know, it's <laughs> so much access to information and it really can help us think. Um, as long as we include critical thinking skills and, and right. for our classrooms, and we also are also consistently uh, include some kind of boundaries for ethics and, you know, support and guidance in that. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Louis says it's like when you are a chess player and play against the computer. Why not? I mean, uh, you think about back in the 1990s when that was uh, common. Uh, so what was the response from teachers? Most teachers felt comfortable with that. Now, I could go on and uh, basically there were other questions that I asked, but uh, the summary was some of these ideas are absolutely great. These were the comments that teachers made to highlight how chat GPT could be useful. I think it's crucial that we allow and even encourage our students to use uh, it, but there should be guardrails, you know, limits and methods going back to what are the methods, uh, how do we demonstrate that? How do we model that with our students? And then as long as students are using a tool as an aid in learning, uh, uh, citing where needed, uh, Mary, you just mentioned that as well. As teachers, we should be teaching them and facilitating how to use AI for their benefit. Um, great. Uh, so one of the things that it, with doing any of this type of use, I think, in providing models to students is that we have to help them. And I usually provide them with the prompt. So being a prompt, prompt that is clear and specific, 
providing context and examples. In other words, you want ChatGPT to create an example like this, include constraints like, you know, what is this going to look at? How long of a summary do you want to ChatGPT to create if that's the purpose? And then try different iterations to achieve and refine your results. In other words, if you put in a prompt and it doesn't give you exactly what you're looking, helping students and training them to create different ways of rephrasing what they're trying to do to elicit the, the best response. Um, Davina says, while we live in a state, we cannot ignore technology. Consulting te technology is fine. Um, whoops, let me go back here. I just lost that comment. Um, uh, but in moderation, I think it cannot replace humans. And uh, Laura mentions about, in addition to boundaries and guardrails, we need to create follow-up you know, de-scaffolding de, uh, de activities to make sure that they got and achieve what we're looking at. Uh, any last comment, James, about, you know, what you saw there before we go on? You know, I, I was just uh, reading uh, some some interesting uh, work out of uh, Canada where they were talking a little bit about open educational resources and the labels that were used to identify that type of material and having a similar sort of classification for AI materials where, uh, you know, it's this has been researched with AI, this has um, been partially written with AI so that people are, are aware of, uh, you know, exactly the creation model. And I think that would be a really interesting way of getting around some of these, you know, guardrails and, and uh, concerns about boundaries is having a system like that in play. Great. You know, one of the things that, you know, we're talking a lot about technology and so forth. And I remember when I started teaching, uh, that was back in the 80s. It was like a piece of chalk and a chalkboard. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some ways, things were simpler then, but I think the evolution of technology, as we're talking about, can really assist in what we're doing. And that's what I want to talk about now. In other words, as we think about the ideas that I shared and what James and Mary have shared about the use. And again, thank you very much for sharing your ideas in the uh, chat, uh, because that helps include um, ideas for teachers, uh, Luis is asking. Uh, so let's talk about that. As you are all aware, and Mary and uh, James, uh, we could spend hours talking about how we can implement, how we can encourage use of chat GPT and other AI technologies with our students. That's for another day, but I'd like to talk briefly about some ideas for teachers. And when I speak about that, let me ask you, Mary, just in general and briefly, do you feel that AI could complement and replace some of the work that you're doing? Uh, in what way? And maybe briefly share an example, and then we'll move on to some other examples as well. How is it helping you? Even more than complement, like it's letting me do things I couldn't do. Uh, phys I physically couldn't do. So just a quick example. I had mentioned, I alluded to this earlier. So we have our, our teachers who have to pass the TOEIC with a B2C1. So that's a boundary. Like they have to do that with that AI in, inside of them to give them answers, right? Um, so we have them do uh, like an opinion question where they talk for a minute, they send it to us on WhatsApp, then I use um, AI to transcribe it, and I'm listening to it, and while AI is transcribing, I'm thinking about the pronunciation points. After that, I use AI to analyze what level it is on the Common European Framework gives me the level, I say, explain why, explains why, I have all the reasons why. I say, give me an example of the same paragraph and let's say it comes out at A2, give me a B1, a B2, and a C1 example of that same paragraph. So then the teacher can, my student can compare those levels. Then I say, okay, now make all the corrections, the grammar, the vocabulary and language corrections to make them for me and explain them. And it does it, and it makes it and explains them. And now all of a sudden my teacher, my student, has a list of grammar, vocabulary, and language use points that they can study and practice. So it gives me the textbook from their one minute text paragraph. It's phenomenal. And that yeah. does hours of work that they have to do without AI. Like they can't, I mean, they can come back <laughs> with more feedback, but they have to work to, to, to take those corrections, internalize them, practice them, you know, because they know that when they go to take the test, it has to come out of them fluently. So uh, it, you, you've you said it very succinctly in a way that, yeah, it can do what we cannot do. And one of the things that I use in my own work is an AI voice generator, 
with that has ultra realistic uh, voices. So you can put in a text and it creates something that I couldn't do myself as well. Now, James, I want to think about for a minute, there was a question, we don't have to answer this right now, but I want to circle back to this because right in the chat, there was a question by David and he says, is it okay to encourage our students in the classroom to use ChatGPT despite the fact that some teachers like me are not very knowledgeable in its use of these technologies. So I wanna, I wanna circle back because that might be something that we cover in the, in the end, but thank you. Be thinking about that, uh, uh, James, and if I don't bring that up, uh, let us know. Uh, some other people are saying I is a compliment uh, because I could write prompts to include vocabulary and reading comprehension to my lesson plans, helps personalize teaching, uh, Davina says, I'm a linguist, and I'm glad that AI-led tools are reducing language loss, especially in translation. All great ideas. And so let me share with you some ideas that I've done, and uh, then feel free to share in the chat other things. But again, James, if we could circle back to that, uh, David's question about just knowing how much we can encourage students if we're not familiar with it. So uh, one of the things, and this is kind of speaking to what you were talking about in a way, Mary, imagine, for example, that I have an existing video, an existing video. You mentioned about maybe a student speech sample, and I want to take an existing video and create a whole lot of content around that existing video. And how can I go about doing that? And one of the things that I think is that I see AI is a collaborative tool like a co-creator in what I'm doing. And I think what it can do is in many ways generate different language tasks based on our prompts that we give it. And I'm going to share some example. But the co-creation or collaborative uh, role is that we have the ability to review, to adapt, to refine, to enhance based on our needs and the students' needs, which AI cannot do in some ways. Yeah, you mentioned, Mary, about inputting uh, perhaps a, a text and AI, you know, you know, generating something around that. I think that's great. Sometimes AI can't determine the emotional needs, instructional needs, the uh, psychological needs of students, but I think your example was, you know, it was spot on. So let me share with you, uh, again, keeping in mind that there are certain benefits, uh, reduced uh, workload, it can. Again, Mary, you just said, you know, it would take me hours and hours to try to do something like that. Content innovation of how we want to create scalability of how much, you know, we want the content to, uh, to cover in terms of number of students, in terms of their levels. But there are challenges that I think we all recognize about quality control, accuracy, bias that is injected. I'm going to share an example. Uh, limited understanding of our own needs, especially your psychological needs as well. So let me briefly share with you some ideas that I've created. And uh, right now, what I'm going to show you is an example of an existing video that I created. And then what I want to do, it's based on honesty, but the ideas that I'm sharing right now could be actually customized to any level. Uh, I'm spe specifically choosing something on honesty because on my website, uh, my children have been, been involved with my website uh, for a long time. You know, I was talking to my daughter yesterday and uh, since 1998, I mean, they go way back, but over the years they've come back. And so sometimes when you hear different voices, you think, Randall, do you have 16 different children? Because it sounds like they're, you know, different ages. And uh, so my uh Two daughters, Aubrey and Emily, created a recording for me on my website, and it was about, is it okay to lie? And so imagine that whether it's your video that you created or you find existing material, an audio file, and you were mentioning about this just a minute ago, Mary, about having an audio or video file and creating and generating a transcript from it. I'm going to show a couple of services to do that. But this example is an, an existing video that I created. But again, as I just mentioned, it could be anything that people create. Um, so what I wanted ChatGPT to do is, number one, is create the learning objectives for this lesson based on the video. Uh, create a title for it. Create pre-listening uh, activities. Generate that transcript. 
create comprehension questions in all flavors and, and types, post listening discussion questions, uh, classroom activities based on different learning modalities, and ChatGPT, could you do that? You know, in five minutes, I'm in a hurry. Uh, so uh, now, certainly, you have to. I go back, even when I use ChatGPT, I have to ask it to refine it, anything that is produced. I think uh, that is really important as well. So let me show you what I've done. First of all, here's the video. I'm not going to play the video today, but is it is it okay to lie? You can find it on my YouTube channel as well. And uh, basically, my daughter, let me, well, actually, let me, let me tell you, one of the uh, things that comes up in the video, I say to my daughters, would it be okay if I'm dying and I have six months to live and I don't tell you because I want to protect you? And my kids were really strong. Dad, that doesn't help protect me. It gives me less time to process the, the scenario and the situation. So uh, they shared a lot of things in that. But one of the things I want to uh, suggest is anytime we use any AI technologies um, to create content, a lot of it, we have to come up with well-crafted prompts uh, that are going to li uh, lead to more useful responses. And the other thing is, is that making sure that the prompts that you use, I'm going to show you the prompts that I use, uh, minimize and reduce the need to have clarifications. It saves on your time and so forth. Um, and uh, it's someone's, oh, Laura's mentioning, I love the topic. You'd have to watch the video because both of my daughters are extremely animated. And uh, they talk about all types of things about whether it's appropriate. If someone has body odor, do you tell them? And my kids go into that as well. Do they have broccoli in their teeth? Do you tell them that? So anyway, so this is what I did. Number one, you mentioned this, uh, Mary, and there are a variety of different tools on the internet that can be used uh, to create a transcript from video to text, from audio to text. And one of the things that I find is that a tool that I might suggest today, unfortunately, might be gone tomorrow. I mean, they, they come and go. But the one thing I'm going to share with you is the one in red. It's called YouTube Transcript I, uh, IO. Uh, the one Sonics is what I do. It's a commercial uh, program that I uh, pay for. It does a really great service. But if people are just interested in dabbling in this, this is what uh, I would use. And James mentions Twee, good for translating short videos. Thank you for sharing that. If you have the actual URL, James, please put that in there as well. So with YouTube's transcript, what I do is I paste in the URL. And the nice thing about this one, not only will it give you a transcript, but with AI now, you'll see summary. And what it'll do is it'll actually generate a summary with actual situational, like it says, situational ethics, protection and deception, candid conversation. And all of this is based on not only providing a transcript, but what this service will do is analyze the information in that transcript to provide you with uh, other information uh, based on what you are trying to accomplish. The next thing what I do with ChatGPT is, okay, I want to create a title. So what I do is I take the transcript that was generated and I say, create five possible topics, three of a more thought-provoking nature and three of a witty or Whether you need a title for your lesson may or may not be relevant, but let's say truth or consequence, the moral dilemmas of lying uh, on a more humorous, okay, the truth about lives and lies, anchovies, monsters, and dead goldfish. Now you might, what it's done is ChatGPT has extracted that possibility from the context. And when I look at that, that might be some type of pre-listing you know, discussion question. What do you think this is about, about anchovies, monsters, and dead goldfish? James and Jim, any thought about anchovies? What could be the lie there? I have, uh, that, that is good on pizza, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> dead goldfish, Mary? Oh, I'm a little lost. I oh, gotta... I'm sorry. Sorry. So it, it generates anchovies, monsters, and dead goldfish. What could be the lie there? Oh, that um, my uh, an elephant came into my. Oh, which one of these would be the lie for the dead goldfish? No, no. But if you said someone's talking about a dead goldfish, what could be the lie when talking with a child? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The lie would be that my I ate five dead goldfish. <laughs> okay, yeah, it could be that. Uh, I gave the scenario with my kids. Uh, the your son's uh, goldfish buddy has died. What are you going to say? And uh, one of my daughters said, tell him the truth. He needs to understand what death is all about. And my other daughter said, no, 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 no. I'm just going to buy a new goldfish and just replace it and just go on with life. Oh. So so that's what chat GPT can do. The next thing is, uh, imagine, for example, based around that same video, create five main objectives for a lesson on honesty and lying geared at ESL students. So what ch can ChatGPT do? It can actually create, uh, you know, objectives for you. Now, we would all agree that we would need to go back and tweak these, revise these, adapt these, because not all are going to be applicable to this particular context. But that's certainly what ChatGPT could do. The next thing is come up with pre-listening discussion questions. Is it okay to lie? And what ChatGPT will do is based on what they've seen, what ChatGPT has read and analyzed, and you were talking about analyzing things, Mary, in the example you gave, is what it will do is it will analyze the information and create these type of uh, prompts that could be used for pre-listening. The other thing is notice down it says cultural perspective, and this is where I would use caution. How do different cultures view lying? And then what you can do in ChatGPT is, are there certain cultures where lying about an illness is more culturally accepted? This is where I would, you know, use care because sometimes what ChatGPT is doing is trying to extract, extrapolate interpretations of what it might be appropriate in different cultures. Here's an example with between Japan and United States. And this is where I would have to, you know, again, express caution on interpreting what this means. Is this representative? Is it engendering? Is this information engendering greater bias in students? Uh, those are all, I think, important questions to be asked. The next thing I want to share with you, I think is kind of uh, interesting, is imagine, for example, that pre-listening, your grandmother gives you a sweater for Christmas and says that it took her three months to finish it. She asks you if you like it, but it's awful looking. Jim, what do you say to your grandma? I would say, thank you, grandma. It looks wonderful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mary? Yeah, I would say, grandma, I so appreciate all the effort you put into creating this, this amazing sweater. Okay. Now, some people might say, well, I'd be, be a little bit more honest. But at the same time, imagine if we add this variable. What if your grandmother's seriously ill and only has a few minutes to live? Would that affect what you say? It might. So, oh, here's something. Laura says, Graham, it looks so comfortable. Thank you. Thank now, you. imagine, for example, you want to use AI. And right now, sometimes as teachers, we use images. We scour the internet or try to come up with something to actually, you know, do some type of pre-listening task using a visual. What I use is Designer uh, by Microsoft. It's an image creator. And what you can do is you can add in to Designer. It's a free service. You type in a grandmother giving a young man a very ugly sweater for Christmas or the other prompt, a grandmother giving a young man a very ugly sweater for his birthday. And what does uh, AI do with that? Here's the one, uh, Christmas. Here's the one for birthday. So if, for example, you're looking at ideas not only in using AI, and again, this is not ChatGPT, but it's an example of an AI service that will generate images for you. Now, you might say, how much can it do? Well, I put in this. Jim, I think you saw this prompt before. An ESL teacher wearing a kimono, holding a grammar book, and a cheeseburger at Machu Picchu. What can ChatGPT, uh, not ChatGPT, AI do for you? There we are. Now, now, you'll probably not use any of these, but this is what the power of AI can do, not simply for, um, you know, for using chat GPT, but can use it in a variety of ways. And here's where we can create images. Now, certainly in the PowerPoint, I'm going to leave these uh, recommendations on you using AI for images and you want to check what are some of the terms of use. Again, you can see these slides in my PowerPoint as well. 
Uh, the other thing is AI, and again, we're uh, I want to leave a couple minutes for discussion here at the end, but AI could generate questions for you in a variety of iterations and types, like uh, multiple choice questions. AI can also create thought-provoking discussion questions based at different levels. And again, you would need to edit and, and uh, you know, the generated material as well. Uh, uh, also, for example, I mean, there are a lot of things that could be done with that. And the one thing I didn't include is you can ask ChatGPT to generate uh, different activities based on different modalities, tactile learning. Uh, it could be listening, it could be auditory. It can do all of that as well. Now, uh, to conclude, and again, you, I think Jim and Mary you know, we could talk about a lot of different ideas and uh, each one of these ideas we could explore in more detail. But I want to talk about uh, these last questions. Uh, number one, I know, Mary, you shared, uh, shared an idea on how you've used AI. Uh, Jim, if you could speak to the question and number two, you know, how can, in what way you could say, are you using AI? Uh, and then what do you think uh, AI will have an impact on the future job market? I may cover that question, but I'd like to look at number two. Uh, how are you using Jim AI? And then we want to circle back to that question of that teacher who asked, I think it was David, you know, to what degree should I be encouraging students to use AI when maybe I don't feel as comfortable and knowledgeable about using it? Jim? So uh, for us, you know, we're using AI uh, as a, a way of, of building our materials faster and, uh, and, and from different perspectives. And so uh, it's something that a lot of our faculty are using we have oer uh, open educational resources and while it doesn't quite fit with that um, it, it is something that we can use in the lessons themselves and so it's a, a really strong tool for quick and really robust lesson creation okay yeah and i think uh, it kind of complements what uh, mary has said is just generating content generating materials you know, certainly analyzing what they're producing as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mary, could you speak to that last question? And and uh, yeah. some people, someone mentioned at the beginning, I don't think AI will replace teacher, but the question is, what impact will it have on teachers? And, you know, what role do we play in using AI? Do you think it will affect the job market in some way as well, in a positive way or a negative way? Yeah. You know, I think um, I think there's a tension, and and the question that, that I think it was it was a Dave's question about you know what do I do if my students are into it and I'm not, um, or I'm scared of it, or yeah, um, there's a tension for us as teachers to how much do I grow and change uh, according to like I, I definitely feel like it's my responsibility to know my students, and uh, so like right now if I, I well. To keep it short it's my responsibility to know my students and if my students are really into and using AI, i feel like it's my responsibility to learn about it i really do at the same time like i'm thinking about what happened during the pandemic and a lot of teachers are like oh my god I, 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 it's not me to teach online we also have to be authentically ourselves and so if i think that if the if the context is changing i might also have to find other ways to teach in ways that really are congruous with myself and who i am so I feel like there's that tension of I need to be myself at the same time I need to know my students and serve my students learning needs. And I think AI is critical. And I would say don't I would say <laughs> this isn't nice to say that. just don't be afraid of it like go for it. It's a playground. <laughs> like to me it's like going into this incredible playground and if you treat it sort of as play for yourself it might be easier to get to know it. Um and you might be surprised at what you can do with it. Um, I think when I see it as only a foe and I kind of put up a wall for that, I'm actually cutting myself off from having like the opportunities that James was talking about in terms of creating materials. It's, it can save so much time and it can be fun and playful um, as well as very serious and academic. You're, you're not losing yourself. So I think that would be my my encouragement or my, my invitation. Um, and at the same time, if it really, really isn't you, then yeah, your job's going to be affected. You might have to find a different kind of job, you know, that you can teach in the way that you'd like to teach. Right. Thank you. 
Uh, Jim, any thought on that same question? And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at some of the comments that are coming in to wrap things up. You know, I, I agree with Mary. I think, you know, one thing we often have a, a false assumption where we think, you know, all the students are using it. They're all comfortable with new technology. And so often that's not the case. They're actually really nervous or, uh, you know, have lots of questions themselves. And so I think if you can sort of step back from from yourself a little bit and open yourself up to that, you know, I, I don't know everything. Let's find out together. Um you know that there's real opportunity to learn together and and i think it would be so much more rewarding so uh, I, I would say go for it you know and have those conversations even if they're difficult right randall I have more, one yeah go ahead um i've been doing a lot of work in costa rica on on preparing our students for the job market and i think the other really important thing is when your students like where are your students headed in their learning what kind of job, what's their job market like? And is this a skill that they're going to need for that job market? And then how can you bring that into the, into the classroom? Great. So integrating based on what they need, uh, whether it be jobs and so forth, uh, bringing that in. Uh, Laura mentions, I think of it as a sandbox, AI. Uh, Yadar says, we have to guide our students on how to use ChatGPT because if we leave them alone, it might uh, be negative in some way. I, I think we would agree with that. Uh, AI is, oh, uh, we should approach it. May says we should approach it with curiosity. I think that's simply what, uh, Mary, you were talking. AI is scary, but amusing at the same time. As Mary said, let's go for it. Uh, I think that's great as well. As someone says, I love Mary's analogy of AI as a playground. Uh, thank you so much, dear James, very short, and Randall Davis. I don't know if it is possible a second session on this wonderful topic, something more practical, because everyone wants to, to learn and to know about this. So, James, your final words today, and thank you uh, so much for your participation, collaboration, and support. Well, thank you. I, I really do appreciate the invitation, and uh, it's lovely to see that uh, people in the chat are asking for a second. Uh, you know, we're all learning this together in real time, and I think, uh, you know, the research that Randall shared today is one of those great conversation starters to try to find our values and our beliefs as educators and, and where we want to move forward with AI and how we want to work with it. But I've seen a tremendous explosion of creativity of people working with ChatGPT, you know, those pictures that we saw earlier. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there to do some some really creative things. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about it today. So we'll see you on a second session, dear James, right? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you, thank you so much. Mary Scholl, please. Thank you all so much. Uh, Randall, thank you so much for leading this and sharing your amazing resources. And it's 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 it means a lot coming from someone who's been involved with this for so many years and has been giving for so many years. Um, and James as well. Thank you so much. I feel like it's been a really interesting conversation and um, a great start. And also just beautiful how, how Randall, how you also wove in the chat and how everybody had a chance to offer things in there. That was it for a really beautiful example of, of, of one way of working with technology and AI. Um, and I, just we'll finish up with the two points. One is how I started, friend or foe. It mm. depends on us. It really depends on us and how we use it. Um, and I, I think sometimes when it's a foe, it's almost like, um, but I'm also a foe to myself. So how can we do with ourselves in our own learning as teachers? And the, the second point I really want to make is go outside, get away from the computer. It's up to each of us to balance our lives. And this is not our life. My life is not AI. My, I'm a human being with a body and a spirit and a soul and hunger and coffee needs. And, uh, you know, it's great to get outside. And, and like, I, I am responsible for balancing my life. And if you balance your life with this and, and, you know, the technology work world stuff with hugging a tree, walking your dog, being with your kids, having, you know, face-to-face -face coffee with no cell phone, that's going to create a meaningful life is the balance. So that's, go out. that's through the air, Mary Scholl. The last thing I want to say, I, I want to thank uh, Jim. I want to thank Mary and for all of you being here today. One of the things I said right at the beginning is the only purpose 
and coming to a live broadcast is that you have a voice. You have an opportunity to share and everything everything in life, Mary talked about that and uh, Jim did, is that involves deep and rich human connection. And I think when we can meet in this way, people can share. I apologize that we didn't read all of your comments, uh, but one of the exciting things is about connecting in this way. And someday, perhaps, we will all visit in person as well. You never know. So thank you very much for joining me today.